All right, we are gonna get started. Are you guys ready for a motherfucking story? <laughs> this is really fun. All right, so, all right. I, I swear a lot, I'm not sorry. <laughs> all right, so, okay, we're gonna start this story now. All right, so I'm gonna begin the story actually by giving you a sense of the setting, the time and the place. And I'm gonna do this in a slightly roundabout way where I'm gonna tell you a different story from a different time and place, and you'll see why in a moment. So this different story is a true story about a woman named Bridget Cleary, whom I welcome you to look up on Wikipedia if you want. So, and Bridget Cleary in 1895 was burned to death by her husband. This took place in Ireland, and their doors and windows were open, all the neighbors could see and hear, nobody did anything to stop it. And then afterwards it went to trial, and this trial was a big media sensation, and 1895 is not that long ago. And there's a lot of interest in it, not just because of the nature of the crime and how horrible it was, but also because of the nature of the defense and how interesting it was. So the defense was that her husband did not intend to murder Bridget Cleary, he was trying to save her because he was convinced that his wife had been kidnapped and replaced by a fairy imposter, a changeling. And that in burning this imposter, he was trying to get his real wife back. And the reason I tell this story is because this defense, as, as strange as it might sound to us, actually carried a lot of weight. Like those, that folklore around fairies and changelings was deeply rooted in that culture. And it played a significant role in the defense and in the sentencing and all that because like people believed that he believed that sincerely. And all these things that we think of as fairy stories, we think of them as like entertainment for children, like it was not, it was serious business to these people. Like these people, it's like, yeah, fairies are real, they're dangerous, they might kidnap your kids or your wife and how do you prevent that? And how do you fix it if it's happened? And like, what countermeasures can you take? Like fairies are supposed to hate iron and so if you put like a knife or scissors, that can help protect your baby from being stolen. Um, all these things, they were like, a pra so these fairy tales, they're practical, it's like the handbook for how do you survive. And I to tell this whole thing because my story takes place in the early Middle Ages and it takes place essentially in our own true history, in our real world. And the only difference is that those fairy stories have an element of truth to them in this world. And it's not a far stretch because the people who were alive during that time sincerely believe that my world that I'm about to tell the story in was the world that they lived in. So even though it's fantasy and there's magic and there's fairies, I want to, to be like deeply grounded in reality to feel more like historical fiction than like traditional fantasy. So that's the setting in which this story takes place. So now I can begin telling you like the events of the story. So the story begins with a young prince and he's not the prince, the one in the log line, he's, but he's a prince. And he is the youngest son of his family. He has got a bunch of older brothers and sisters and he doesn't really take anything very seriously because of that. Um, so when he comes of age, he's like, you know, like screw this and screw this life. Like um, I'm young, I'm hot, I'm rich. Like I'm just gonna explore the world. And so he's exploring the world um, and in his course of his adventures, he meets a fairy princess and they fall in love and they have what's very much like a classic literary romance, like very intense and passionate and obsessive and kind of possessive. And they have a baby and they name him Rowan. So, so far in the story, we've got Rowan, the baby. We've got mom, who's a fairy. We've got dad, who's a human prince. And there's, they're this little family of three and they roam the world having adventures and everything is wonderful. Then dad's family suffers a tragedy where 
essentially his entire family, his parents, his siblings, everyone who's ahead of him in the succession dies in the same disaster, which is based on real historical disasters where this sort of thing happened and would like create succession crises and that sort of thing. And so in this, in this event, in this, in this like terrible tragedy that happens, when I tell the story, I, I really want to explore this, this sort of sometimes underexplored side of disasters where like obviously there's this intense like personal loss and grief but in real life when a person dies a lot of times there's simultaneously like a giant like legal slash financial slash logistical nightmare that hits you at the same time when you're least prepared to deal with it so this is like an extreme version of that because dad is like it's like the message is like hey uh all your family is dead also you need to come home right the fuck now like, you've got a lot of work to do. So, um, dad has this moment where he's, he's trying to deal with this sudden calamity and then he, he's telling his lover about it and he's telling her like, I, I'm really sorry, I, I have to go home and I, I have to do this and I wasn't expecting to have to do this, but like, are you gonna leave? And there's like this crossroads with them and she says, no, I'm not gonna leave. Like, we, like, you belong to me, and I belong to you, and we are gonna, we're, we're meant to be together. We're always gonna be together. And so it's this like, really romantic, really passionate thing where she promises that she will, she, she will come with him. If, he, if that's what he has to do, she will come with him. She will live that life with him, pass as a human, be his queen. So this is like a really you know, amazing moment for them as a couple. And they travel, the three of them, back to his home castle. And there's this amazing, glorious, like, coronation, like, pageantry, like, really, like, classic fantasy stuff. And she is, like, super beautiful, super charismatic, so everyone loves her. And everything's really beautiful and romantic for a while. And of course, because this is my story, like, pr before long, the romance starts to fray, where it turns out in the day-to-day, -day, like, passing as a human just sucks a lot for her. You know, like trying to like control her wild urges and living this lie. And it also turns out in practice, like being king sucks a lot. Like this guy was originally, you know, he was like a, this like dashing adventurer archetype. And now he's like this browbeaten like administrator who has to do politics and taxes and and the only reason he does it is because he's got tremendous survivor's guilt, where he, his family was always kind of exasperated with him and he was always away gallivanting around the world while they were doing all the like shit work. And now they're gone, he, he never got to say goodbye and he has no way to honor them. And, and he's kind of throwing, he's overcompensating, he's throwing himself into workaholism to try to overcompensate and not really directly confront his grief. Like instead of grieving and crying, he's like just working. And like mom can tell that this is the case, that this is dynamic is happening and she is not a fan. Like she wants him to like properly like feel his emotions and like confront it directly. And, and she becomes increasingly convinced that this job is just bad and bad for him and bad for all of them and that they should just quit. Like, um, and so as dad is confiding in her, increasingly over time, she starts to have this like, I think you should just quit kind of energy. And it comes from a well-intentioned place, but to him, it's like he would really rather her be like, you can do it. It's really hard, but you can do it. So they grow further and further apart. And they also start having disagreements about parenting. So um, I'll take this opportunity now to kind of give you a sense of Rowan, this baby, who's now a toddler, like, like two or three years old. And um, the way to understand Rowan's character, so first of all, he is a realistic small child, which you don't actually see that often in fiction. So he, and the way I think of small children is that they're essentially wild animals, where <laughs> like, it's, it's as though you like went into the forest or like the wilderness and you kidnapped a chimpanzee and you're like, you're gonna like come home and wear shoes and <laughs> live in my house full of nice things, it's gonna be great. Like this is what toddlers are like and all toddlers as far as I can tell. And so, and, and fairies are like these like untamed nature spirits. 
So Rowan being half fairy is like particularly so. So he's wild and rambunctious and embodied and very alive. Uh, he's also very willful, like very stubborn. You know, gets like throws proper tantrums like the way real children do when he doesn't get his way. And but counterbalanced against that part of his personality, he's also deeply empathic. So and that's kind of more his fairy side, like kind of whatever people around him are feeling, he will feel it too, whether he wants to or not. So he's got this dual nature, like these two aspects that kind of hold each other in check. Uh, he's also, he loves animals, and animals love him. So this is like approaching like Disney princess levels of like, like you know, animal um, affinity. So that's Rowan. So anyway, like, mom and dad start to have disagreements because like, for example, like Rowan, <laughs> Rowan really likes to be naked. Like, this is also a real thing with real kids. Like, he loves to take his clothes off. And um, mom and dad have different reactions to that where like, mom's like, oh, like, you know, like, yeah, you're free, like, woo. She thinks it's really beautiful. And dad's like, kid, you can't be naked in front of the guests. Like, it's not appropriate. And it's like this classic, classic parenting dilemma where on the one hand, you want your kid to be expressed, self-expressed be unique. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want them to be so weird that they'll never find a job. <laughs> and um, so mom and dad come down on opposite sides of this dilemma. And mom, in particular, has this thing she likes to do with Rowan, where um, every now and then, she'll kind of steal into his room like late at night and wake him up. And she'll be like, hey, kid, like, it's the full moon. Do you want to see some magic? And he's like three, so he's like, fuck yes. <laughs> he doesn't literally say that. All the dialogue, is, all the dialogue in this show is paraphrases. Um, but but he, he's like, like, yes, I would like that. And so they go out and um, beyond the grounds of the castle into like, she'll find, for example, like a, like a deserted field, like a freshly tilled field, and she'll kind of park him and, and like make a little, like devise a little crown for him out of, out of plants, and then she'll do this amazing dance for him under the moonlight. And it's like, you know, fairy dancing, it's like very like improvisational and chaotic and it's beautiful. And as, she, as she's dancing, like, you know, these, these plants are growing out of the earth around her. Like they're like these weeds and brambles and roses in particular are, are a thing with her. Like these, these roses are like growing up and forming this dome around them, this amazing amphitheater and she's dancing. And then the next morning, it's, it's still there, and the farmers will come by, they're like, oh, the fairy's been dancing. Like, you know, must, must have been fairies. And this, this gives dad anxiety. So um, the whole, she's supposed to be passing as a human, and she, she might blow their cover if, if she keeps doing this. And her perspective on that feedback is like, oh my god, can we not have this one thing? You know, she, she's sacrificed so much passing as a human. This is the one thing she still does to connect with her heritage, to connect Rowan to his heritage. And so they start fighting a lot over this. And the more they fight, the more anxious dad gets, the more controlling he gets. Like he starts posting guards to prevent them from leaving the grounds. And she starts to feel really trapped. And, um, and Eventually, and, and meanwhile, like Dad is trying to like work on Rowan. He's like, you know, don't just just say no. Like, you know, if she if she tries, to don't leave the castle at night. And and Rowan doesn't like seeing his dad unhappy, so he's like, okay, Dad. And um, but you know, he's he's fucking he's three, and the, these 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 escapades are the most amazing things he ever experiences. So like, he keep and she's very persuasive, very charismatic. So they keep going, and this tension keeps growing, and and finally, it gets to a point where. So mom had this talisman that was given to her by her own mother when she started like dating this like human person. And um, normally to cross between the worlds, you have to go to special places where the boundaries thin. But th with this talisman, with this talisman, she can do it without going to such a place. And the only catch is once it's invoked, it can she can never come back. It's like a one-way ticket. And she resists for a long time. She wants to save dad. She wants, she wants, she thinks all of them should leave this situation. But finally she gets desperate enough that she's like, you know, forget dad, I need to save myself. I need to save my child. And, you know, so she, she wakes Rowan up late at night as she does. And Rowan's got this like twinge of guilt, but he goes with her and she takes 
them to some spot on the grounds, and she starts, she starts doing her dance, but like the, the plants are really kind of sinister and dark and brambly and thorny and grasping, and like the, it's got this like really dark energy, and Rowan's like, this is really weird and intense, but uh, okay. And, um, and, th and, then, and then she's like, Rowan, it's very important that when the moment comes that you take my hand, because like this talisman, it targets herself personally. So for her to bring Rowan with, with her, Rowan has to like come, has to willingly come with her. And so he's like, oh, okay. And 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 then like you know she she invokes this talisman and the spell is starting to take effect and like her, her she her body is glowing and starting to become like transparent in this like really spooky way. And then as this is happening, Dad charges up on a horse and he is furious. Like he is angrier than we've ever seen him. And he's like, you know, he charges up and he, and he, and he like, like, you know, he's like confronting Rowan. He's like, you're, you're like getting the fuck on this horse right now. We are going the fuck home. And so now this, this poor kid, Rowan, he's like, he's like, like, like mom wants one thing and dad wants another. And he, and everything is, they're both being really unusual and really intense. And he's like, he's really, confused and scared and young and he, he, he doesn't know what he's supposed to do. And what breaks the tie is he remembers that he had promised that he would stop leaving the castle at night. And if he were a stereotypical like full fairy, he wouldn't give a fuck because like fairies are all about like doing what's in the moment. Like that was the past, like, I can't be accountable for that person's promises. Like, uh, but, but, <laughs> like, but humans, humans have a sense of honor and a sense of shame. So Rowan feels shame for his broken promise. And so he goes with dad. And then dad scoops him up on the horse and he starts riding away fast. And Rowan's like, what, what, like dad has basically inferred what was going on. And Rowan's like, what, what about mom? Like, and dad's ignoring him, just like really intent and focused. And then Rowan starts to freak out and panic and goes, stop! And he slams his hands onto like the horse's shoulders. And the horse, who had been at like a flat out gallop, like stops so suddenly that like, that dad almost like falls off and, and he's trying to get it back under control. And meanwhile, Rowan kind of like Tarzan swings his way to the ground and like, and now he's sprinting desperately back the way he came. and. Dad is panicking because like he like he might lose his son, and he he's trying to chase after him on the horse. And as he's doing that, like these like animals materialize out of the ground and the air, like rabbits and bats, and they like kind of like spook the horse and and get in its way, like stopping him. And Rowan Rowan's sprinting and sprinting, and, and he, he 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 makes it back to this this dome, this rose dome, and he like bursts in and he's he's crying out for his mother, and she's gone. And where she was, was is just a single wild rose growing where she used to be. And that's the end of Act One. Mom's mom's gone. So there's four acts in total, and there'll be like a really short intermission between Acts Two and Three. So I'm going to continue on with Act Two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so mom, is, mom has disappeared and Rowan, this little child, he's heartbroken. He doesn't understand why she's gone and why she left. And dad's got his own grief about this, but, and he, but he's, that he's dealing with in his own quiet way. And he, 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 Rowan needs to understand that it's like not his fault, but dad doesn't, dad doesn't want to get into the whole fairy thing, because Rowan, of course, doesn't know that he's half fairy because they're passing as humans. And dad is worried that if Rowan knows the truth that he'll run away and try to find mom and, and he'll have lost, at this point, his only remaining living family. So he tells like a twisted version of the truth, which is that mother was taken by the fairies, that she was kidnapped. And by the way, the fairies would be very interested in kidnapping you as well. So don't let yourself be taken. So throughout act two, we're kind of like exploring Rowan's childhood as he's growing up. And um, there are numerous credible attempts to kidnap him by various agents of fairydom. 
And it, usually they like take the guise of some animal and come and befriend him and then like start to lead him away. And uh, there are a couple close calls. So dad, you know, he starts implementing like security measures. So he's got like a, like a kooky ferriologist consultant like person <laughs> who like, you know, advises him. Uh, and uh, so they set up, first they, what they do is they ward the castle. So the castle is like inherently a place of power. You know, it's, it's like very old, has been in their family a long time and kind of represents, yeah, so, so, the, the, so the castle's already a place of power and then over each of the windows and doors and entranceways they create these like iron works, like these wrought iron metal works because iron is like, you know, basically like anti, is like an anti-fairy substance and so they, they create these iron works and cast these and chant these like rituals on them and now it's essentially like an invisible force field that encases the castle, and the castle is like an anti-magic zone that fairies, the fairies cannot enter without the consent, explicit consent of the master of the house. So Rowan is drilled very, very early, but because like he's you know part of this lineage, like he's like, under no circumstances should you ever let anyone in, because like you should never personally invite anyone in, because if they're a fairy, that that lets them come in, and if they're not a fairy, like the servants can let them in. Um, so anyway, like as long, so they've got the castle warded, and as long as Rowan is inside, like he's safe. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, Rowan does not like being inside. Like he's like oh this like wild child, like half fairy, like person. Like he wants to be outside all the time, and so and then he's like vulnerable when he's outside, and so they have to increase their security, and they have to like provide him some way of being protected when he's outside. So they fashion these like iron protectants for him to wear that as long as he's wearing them, he can't be seen or touched by fairies. Um, the unfortunate thing, though, is that iron hurts him. It doesn't, if he were a full fairy, it would burn him, like he would like, catch on fire when he's touched by iron, but he's only half fairy, so instead it leaves no marks and does no obvious damage, but it just is painful to touch. And the tragic thing is they don't believe him that it hurts because Rowan is in general like a very willful and eccentric person and he also doesn't like getting his hair cut or wearing shoes and he's proven himself like willing and capable of lying, cheating, manipulating his way out of wearing shoes. So and like they're trying to get him to like put on his iron protection. He's like, I don't want it! You know, you're not very articulate as a young child. And, and they just think he's like being a brat. Um, so this poor kid wants to be outside all the time, has to wear these like essentially like torture devices to go outside. And sometimes he just gets fed up with the whole situation and he'll like escape out the window onto the roof. And then there are these sequences where like, you know, he's kind of dancing under the stars and like in indulging his fairy, like wild child, hippy dippy animal urges. And these moments are the only time that mom can ever see him when he's outside the wards without his protectants. And so to her, it looks like this kid is miserable. Like she only ever sees him when he's at his most exasperated. So to her, it's like, he's, look at him, he's such a fairy. And, he, and to her, it looks like he's being like abused and repressed. And um, so she's like, she's like more determined than ever to like get him back. And there starts to be these like weird occurrences in the kingdom, like lots of random bad luck, like a storm will cause a tree to fall on a, on a building and it's like, oh, that's unfortunate. But then stuff like that starts happening more and more and more frequently to the point where it starts to feel supernatural. And so dad has to spend increasing amounts of time outside of the castle dealing with shit. And Rowan is left alone increasingly and when he ventures to express some like sadness or resentment about that, like dad's pretty brusque about it. Like he's like, well, yeah, like this is what it means to be rulers. Like, you know, like you, you've grown up with all these privileges. Like you have, you've always had the best of everything and those privileges don't come for free. The price is that your life doesn't really belong to you. It belongs to them. So you just gotta suck it up. And so Rowan learns these are kind of like the values that Rowan learns from his father. And um, so he and dad kind of have like, like a complicated relationship. Um, but 
there, there is at some point a bit of a breakthrough where, um, so, so the way it happens is, so Rowan as a prince is expected to kind of like be involved in the military and that kind of thing like as he gets older and so he has all this martial training and as when he's a child like this generally takes place with like these wooden sparring swords and then when he's like 10 or 11 or so like it's time to graduate up to like metal like steel sparring swords and it's supposed to be really exciting and that day comes and he is just getting his ass handed to him in the training yard because of course the sword is painful for him to hold and dad is watching this and it and it doesn't make a lot of sense because he can see how, he, he, he's like performing much worse than usual and um, he can see that Rowan hates this like that he so Rowan's very proud and he hates getting like owned in this way and and as dad is watching this he realizes that holy fuck like Rowan was telling the truth the whole time about the iron. And Dad's like, like I'm an asshole. Like he, he like he realizes he, he realizes like what he's kind of been like imposing on him all these years. And so he starts coming out of that, he starts like making more concessions for him and accommodations. Like he um like the next day, like all the swords have now like wooden hilts instead of bare steel, so now it's, and he also like, his iron protectants, he like kind of gives him, fashions for him like a gentler version of it that's like not quite as large or painful, like more comfortable for him. And then the culmination of this, so when Rowan's about like 13 or 14 and it's his birthday and it's like kind of like a milestone birthday, um, because like people kind of like grow up pretty quickly in those, in those, in that era. So it's his birthday and dad is, has like a surprise for him and he takes him up through the castle, like up all these stairs to the highest point of the castle and then they come into this room, this bedroom and it's inferred that this is like his new bedroom and Rowan's kind of confused because like the room's like not that impressive, it's like kind of smaller than his old one and it's like, okay, it doesn't seem like an upgrade but okay. And, and dad's like, okay, the room's not that special, but it's got a great view. And he goes and he opens what looks to be a set of balcony doors, but when he opens them, he reveals that it's actually this enormous garden, this enormous rooftop garden, like this beautiful circular garden with trees and shrubs and grass. And the entire garden is kind of covered with this like iron, almost looks like a birdcage, like this iron dome with these bars. And because of that, um, it's it's warded. It's like part of the it's part of the castle's protection. And, and Rowan's like dumbstruck. Like it like doesn't it like doesn't compute for a long time. Like he's like, wait, this is this is for me. Like this is my room now. And this is this gesture is the most dramatic gesture Dad has ever made. That he's like, I love you and I care about you. I want you to be happy. Like this garden has no practical purpose other than to make him happy. So it's like this really special moment for them. Um. And then shortly thereafter, um, Dad comes to Rowan and he says, "I have to, I have to go on a mission." And he, he and Rowan's like, what? "Okay." Like he's kind of used to it by this point, but it's like, "When will you be back?" He's like, "I don't know, but I will be back." So just you know, be good. Remember everything I've taught you. Like you know, I'll just just wait for me. All right. And Rowan's like, "Okay." And they say their goodbye, and Dad heads off on this mission that he's being annoyingly cryptic about. And so now Rowan's alone at the castle and while dad's away, we sort of explore like, so, so this has been going on for a while, but it's been getting worse as he gets older. So he's, he's having these like various like struggles with the staff. In particular, like there's like a chancellor figure who's like the second in command, like the guy who's in charge when dad's away. And when dad's away, like the number one imperative that he like places on his staff is make sure that Rowan does not get kidnapped by fairies. Like that is rule number one. And so Rowan, you know, he's like 13 or 14. He's like starting to take, to take on a role in the military. He's trying to like be taken seriously. He's like this like preteen like pipsqueak, but trying to be taken seriously. And like, it really does not help that he's being like coddled and babied and like fussed over all the time. And so they're having their various like struggles. And then they get word at the castle 
that dad has disappeared. So dad had left with this entourage of people and just one morning, he was gone. They couldn't find him. Like there was no sign of struggle. It was like he evaporated. And so this news makes its way back to the castle and it is big fucking crisis, obviously. And it brings to a head this conflict that's been brewing between Rowan and this chancellor guy where Rowan's reaction is like, holy shit, like, like we, we have to find him. We have to go out. We have to figure out what happened to him. And, and this, this chancellor's perspective is like, holy shit, the king has, is missing or has probably been taken by fairies and we better extra make sure that his only heir does not also get taken, like, you know, threat level of fairy kidnappings has just been like elevated to extreme. Um, we gotta hunker down, like defend ourselves. So they're engaging in this power struggle and at first it really seems like this chancellor is winning, like he's very experienced, he's been doing this job for like Rowan's grandfather. And then one night he is roughly woken up by soldiers and like thrown into a prison cell and he's really confused, doesn't know why this is happening. And then Rowan comes in and now he understands what's happening. And what's happening is Rowan is staging a military coup. Um, slash seizing his rightful power, depending on whose narrative you subscribe to. <laughs> and so like this guy's like, oh God, this is more serious than he thought. He's trying to save his ass, trying to like, you know, negotiate his way out of this prison cell. And Rowan's like, look, it's not personal, but I have to do this. And you are in my way. You're slowing me down. Thank you for your service. <laughs> and he leaves. So now Rowan's in charge. Rowan is in charge. It is uh, first item on the agenda of the Rowan administration is we got to find dad. Like living or dead, we're going to go out, we're going to figure out, this, solve this mystery of what's happened to dad. So he is like massing this big expedition, like massing together all the soldiers and like all this like support and preparing for this big expedition. So we're going to leave him there for the time being and find out what happened to dad. So, all right, rewinding back to when dad left. So dad left because he, he's kind of suspected by now that all this random bad luck and shit that's happening is essentially his mo Rowan's mother waging magic fairy warfare against his kingdom over Rowan to get him back. And that the only way things will ever stop or get better is if he somehow finds her and convinces her to cut it out. So he's out searching and he finds like a woods witch, like this like strange woman who lives in the forest and like claims to have a, an affinity for fairies. And this woman, she allows mom to possess her essentially because mom of course cannot return to the human realm, but she still has like magic. She still has an ability to influence the human realm. And so she like, you know, possesses this woods witch and dad's able to talk to her for the first time. Like he hasn't spoken to his wife in like 10 years. And it starts out like really like, you know, business like, like I'd like to negotiate the cessation of hostilities <laughs> against my kingdom. And it pretty quickly devolves into a lover's spat where it pretty quickly becomes like, how, how could you leave me? Like you promised, you promised you would always be mine and that I would be like, how could you betray me like this? And how could you try to take Rowan away from me? And, um, and then it twists on itself and they, they've got this really complicated like love hate thing now and, and it twists and it becomes come back, like come, come back home. Like we'll, 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 we'll mend whatever was broken about us and we, we miss you and Rowan misses you and like please like come back home. And she tells him that he, she can't and he hadn't realized, he hadn't known that, that her, she, the magic, she's magically barred from returning to the human realm. So he's processing that this news and, and then she turns it around. She's like, you and Rowan should come and join me in Fairy World. And so dad's really in, in this, dad's got this conflict where on the one hand he's very tempted by this because back before his family died, like they'd always fantasized about that. They'd always fantasized about one day he would come and join her and they would explore this magical realm together. But you know, he, He's like, I, I, I can't, you know, I've got these duties and now they're just rehashing and rehashing this fight that they've had countless times by now. And they're, they're at an, this, you know, at this impasse and then they finally 
but they finally reached this compromise, this deal, and this is how it works. So she will stop her warfare, and in exchange, he will come with her to fairy world for one day. And during that day, she will, um, he will consent to being placed under a spell that causes him to forget that his family ever died because her hypothesis is that this whole narrative about honor and duty and obligation is really an elaborate cover story for him like being still really fucked up about what happened to his family and not really confronting it and that if, he, if that hadn't happened that this is his true heart's desire to come and live with her. And so he, he takes her up on it. He's like, okay. And, and then the second part of the deal is that he will relax the wards of the castle so that she can scry on Rowan, that she can, even if she cannot enter, she can at least see him. And um, the way that these wards work, they're like keyed to the, the master of the castle, and so he can do this by just consenting to it, just like you can invite a fairy in. So, so they go, and he, he goes with her, and they have this beautiful day in fairy world. Like, you know, this, the spell takes effect, and he, and his memory now, like they never died, and they, they, and he eventually like ran away with her, like he always wanted to, and they've been, and now they live together, and they're like so in love, and and he, his 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 like personality like reverts overnight back to how he used to be, and they have this amazing romantic beautiful day, and at the end of the day, she can't bring herself to lift the spell, like like he's so happy and. They're so happy, and like there are all these things she wanted to show him, and they barely scratch the surface. And like just just one more day won't hurt. One more day, like I swear to Mother God, tomorrow I'll lift the spell, and he'll 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 understand. And so then she's procrastinating and procrastinating, and so this thing is dragging on. And the one really terrible part of all this, besides you know that he's under the spell now for longer than he'd agreed to be, is that. Part of the spell, because the spell sort of depends on plausibility, like you can't believe clearly absurd things, um, it causes him to forget that they ever had Rowan because the illusion doesn't make sense otherwise. Like if, like it'd be like, where, where is he? Why is he not with us? So like he, he just is ca caused to forget about it. And so this is really painful for her because he's like, oh, I'm really happy, but it's like really a shame that we've never been able to have kids. Like I really wish we could have kids. And so she is now more determined than ever that she has to get Rowan like, and, and bring him home so that she and dad and Rowan can all three of them like, be together in the fairy world. So she comes and she travels to the castle and, in the guise of this woods witch who is like her, her ally. And uh, Rowan, now we're gonna switch and rejoin Rowan. Rowan's like, you know, organizing this expedition and it's like late at night and everyone's kind of encamped outside and he's just like pacing the castle alone like you know thinking about like just like mentally going over this expedition and he hears a knock at the door and he's a bit sleep deprived and a bit desperate so like it, it should be it should have registered that it's very strange for there to be a knock like people don't generally knock at castles like they are greeted and then they are escorted and then they're announced like like they don't just rock up and knock like um but in his state he's his sleep deprived state he's like maybe it's dad maybe maybe, maybe dad's back and so he goes and he answers the door and it's it's not dad it's this this weird old woman who uh, how how did she get past the Guards, oh, okay, um, and, and so now m mom is looking at him and is like, oh my God, like her son, her beautiful son, she's not seen him. She hasn't seen him this close in like 10 years. And she wants to say, it's me, it's me, baby, it's me, it's your mother, but that doesn't make sense. She's not in her natural body. So what comes out is I'm, I'm a friend of your mother's. And now in Rowan's head, he's like, oh, it's a fairy. Oh shit. Oh no. <laughs> like, fuck. <laughs> like, woo, woo, woo. This is not a drill. There's a fairy at the door. Oh, 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 jeez. Okay. So, so you know, he's been trained for this eventuality, uh, and so she's like, "Can I come in?" He says, "No, you may not." <laughs> That's the one rule that that if he remembers nothing else, like never let anyone in. And um, 
he starts to close the door on her. And she goes, wait, wait, wait. I have something for you. And then she produces for him this single rose. And she's hoping that he'll remember, like, you know, he's very young when she disappeared, but she's hoping he'll remember that night and that, th that it'll signify that she's telling the truth. And he does remember, and what it does is it makes him very upset. Because to him, it's like these fucking fairies stole his mother, and now they're taunting him. And so he, he gets really emotional and really upset, and he, he, he tells her essentially to get the fuck out. And now mom is having a crisis because this conversation is not going the way she had imagined that it would. Because like, she thought he was this like wild fairy creature, and Rowan is not how she expected to find him. Like the the son that she remembers is this like wild little beastling, and this like buttoned up, serious faced prince. Like he's like a stranger to her. And he's, when did he start wearing shoes? He hates shoes. Like to her, it looks like he's essentially had the fairy abused out of him, and that. They've, they've like stamped it out. And now he doesn't even remember her. He, he's forgotten her and everything she ever stood for. And she's, she's really upset about this. And fairy magic is kind of based off of emotion. Like if you're having really strong emotions, you can cast really powerful magic. And, and so she, she's like having, he's, he's like leaving, uh, you know, he's like closing the door on her again. And, and she's like, come home, like, 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 like come home, like baby. And, and, and he, He's like, he's like, no, like, fuck you. And, 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 and she's like, come home. And this spell, like, kind of, this magical energy just, like, bursts out of her, and the spell ripples out across the land. It's like this, you know, this, like, uncontrollable thing because she's so upset. And the spell does a number of things. So the, the first effect that it has is um, it turns, so that this kingdom is made up of farmland and towns, and it then as a spell is rippling out, it transforms into deep primeval wilderness, like huge old trees. And then all the, all the citizens of Rowan's realm turn into wild animals, kind of like sentient talking wild animals. And then furthermore, the spell is really powerful. So like furthermore, all of their surrounding neighboring kingdoms forget that they ever existed as a kingdom. And like, so now like their memories have all been like retconned to be like, oh yeah, like that, those lands were always deep primeval untamed forests that we never tried to tame for some reason. Why, oh, it's, it's, it's maybe it's haunted? Oh yeah, it's totally haunted. Yeah, like, <laughs> you know, like the illusion is like a little tenuous there. So it, it, so it kind of acquires this like overnight, this like spooky, like haunted forest reputation. And um, so anyway, like this stuff is, and obviously Rowan doesn't see all of this, but he can tell like something very weird is happening. He's like, what are you doing? Stop! And, and he, he, he like steps over the threshold to challenge her like with his sword and, and his panic, he's not wearing his amulet, his iron protectant. Um, normally he never leaves the castle without it, and, but he's, he's panicking and he goes out without it and she gets a hand on him and as she touches him, he turns into a beast. So I'm gonna pause and paint you a picture of this Rowan beast. So Rowan beast, he's 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 like a full like quadruped like wild animal, and he's about the size of a lion, but he's got the hindquarters of a wolf, like wolf legs and tail. His front paws though are more feline than canine. Like cats can kind of twist their wrists and grab things, kind of use them almost like hands. And he's got um, he's got like a wolf muzzle and he's got these antlers, like these, at this point in the story, he's still only like 13 or 14, so they're, they're like these little spike young buck antlers. Um, and he's got these deer ears to match the antlers, big swiddly, expressive deer ears. And finally, he's got huge golden cat eyes, like the kind of eyes that a cougar or a tiger would have. So that's the Rowan beast. So Rowan, Rowan's been transformed and he's like, like alarmed and he, he, he like scuttles backwards into the castle and as he crosses over the threshold of this castle um, he turns back into a human and uh, and he, he's just like collapsed on the ground like like what was that <laughs> like what, what the fuck was that and, and he he kind of creeps up to the threshold of the castle and he he like extends 
an arm out over the threshold, and as it's extending, it's turning into a paw. So he's like animal outside of the wards, human inside the wards. And then he pulls his arm back really quickly, and she's watching him, and she says, you're, you're afraid of it. You're, they've taught you to be afraid of who you really are on the inside. And that makes no sense to him. And he, he, he's like, ah, you know, threatening didn't clearly, clearly didn't improve his situation. So he's like, now he's like pleading. He's, I don't know what we've done to offend you, but please put it back to how it was before. Like, please restore my kingdom. I will, I'll do anything. And she said, I can't. Like, you know, the, the spell is cast. You have to come home to lift it. And he's like, what, did, what does that mean? And she's like, come home. Come, come home and the spell will be lifted and then she disappears. And that is the end of Act Two. <laughs> so we're gonna take, we're gonna take a, a short break. Unfortunately, because my, my time check is running so close to the limit, it's gonna be only about five minutes. But you know, please stretch your legs, use the bathroom. Um, and then, yeah, we'll return with Act 3, soon. All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Woo! All right, so Act 2 started with this crisis happening, essentially, in this kingdom. And we're going to leave them to their crisis for a bit and switch tracks. So we're going to get introduced now to two entirely new characters in an entirely other kingdom whose stories are about to intersect with this story. So uh, these characters, they, there's, you know, this kingdom, of course, has various neighbors. And their neighbor to the north is this kind of like mountainous region. And that has got its own king and all that. And um, the first character I'm going to introduce you to, her name is Maud. And she is a princess of that kingdom. She is the youngest child and only daughter of her family. And to give you a sense of, of Maud's character, so she, she's about Rowan's age, and she, she has a very similar personality in many ways. She has a number of her own unique eccentricities. So one of them is very much based on myself as a child, where, so as a kid, I was like an armchair wilderness survival enthusiast which is the worst kind of armchair enthusiast because I didn't hike or backpack or camp. I just read lots of books on the subject. And um, yeah, I, I just love to fantasize about that stuff. And so she, she's really similar where like when her and her family go on these escapades in the forest, uh, she'll, she'll come like running up to her brothers and she's like covered in like dirt and twigs and she's got like this handful of mushy berries and she's like look look I found food and um, I know the idea of wild food sounds very romantic but I did eventually go and take a practical wilderness survival class in college and it is not tasty for the most part <laughs> it is not like it like the greens are really bitter and the fruits are really tart and there's a reason we invented agriculture to fix that <laughs> so so she's running up and, and she's like offering them these berries and they, they're humoring her and they, they try some and they're like, this is, this is terrible. Like, why, why are you feeding this to us? She says, shut up, like, you, you, you have to eat it. It's, it's sustenance, like we're, we're surviving. And, and they're like, you're, you're crazy, but okay. And so that's her. <laughs> she's, she's very weird and um, people are frequently exasperated with her. Uh, she has one brother in particular, his name is William, he's like the, the closest to her in age, and he kind of tolerates her weirdnesses a bit more, has more, has like an affectionate relationship with her, and William is very much kind of like the classic fantasy hero, especially compared to Rowan and Maud, like he's like, you know, like tall and dark and like, you know, he's kind of like, he's like a like a Jon Snow or Aragorn type character, like this outdoorsman. And, um, and he and Maude are like best friends and they go out, they love to like go out in the woods and like go on adventures together. 
and she, you know, like, he, she'll, she'll kind of, like, needle him and, and whine and, and get him to, like, teach her things that he's not supposed to be teaching her. And um, they are really drawn to the forest, and they're really especially drawn to Rowan's forest because that, that looks like the good shit. Like, like that, like that, um, like, that looks like proper deep forest. And, but when any time they go near it, the like the common folk are like, no, like you you mustn't go into that forest. It's haunted. It's it's uh, it's the realm of the fairy king. If you go in it, you will you will be taken, and you will bring bad luck upon us all. Like you mustn't enter that forest. And William and Maud are like that. That sounds like a story invented to keep the kids away from the good stuff. Like, <laughs> like we, like we are really interested in that forest. So they have all these little escapades and little adventures in Rowan's forest, and you know, Maud will like do her berry routine, and William will humor her, and you no, know, they'll, they'll, they have numerous of these little excursions into the forest. And meanwhile, Rowan, uh, meanwhile, William has been teaching her archery and various other skills, and she's starting to get really cocky, where she starts to think she's really good at archery, and William, like, William kind of wants to take her down a peg, like, no, 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 like, like, being, like, the point of archery is not to shoot at targets, the point is to shoot at game, so, like, you're not, you're not gonna, it's, and it's a totally different, it's totally different when it's in the field, so, like, you're not gonna be, like, a proper, uh, Archer until you've taken game, and she's like, okay, so take me hunting, and he's like, no, and she's like, please, and um, she she works on him, and eventually he's like, oh, just to get you to shut up, like, okay, so he takes her hunting, and so they're they're in Rowan's forest, and he's like, kind of showing her how to stalk and read signs and stuff, and she she like really wants to be good at this, so she's like really you know paying close attention, and then they they find the trail of a deer and they're stalking this deer and he and they're they get kind of close to it and he's like whispering to her like what to aim for and you know you gotta like get the best shot you can and then run up and like take it out like finish it off with your knife if you don't kill it outright and she uh like she 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 really wants to be good at this but also like she's never done this before she's never killed anything so she's like got her her bow and arrow and she's like she she's like really nervous um, and as she shoots, at the very last moment, she flinches just a hair, just enough that she misses her intended target, and she gets the deer in its leg instead. And, and the deer kind of like, like falls to the ground, and, and William kind of like jumps out with his hunting knife to like go finish it off. And as he rushes up to this deer, the deer cries out, wait, please don't kill me. <laughs> and, and William's like, what? Like what? What the fuck? Like what, what's this? And 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 as he, as he's as he's like whoa, like like trying to process this deer talking to him, there's this roar that rings out, and then this wolf, lion, stag creature like comes flying out of the trees and tackles him to the ground, and it, and it's like this really like like violent like scuffling, and Maud is freaking out, and she 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 runs out from her cover and she's like stop 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 and Rowan kind of turns and freezes like he didn't realize that she was there he thought this hunter guy was acting alone and he's like this like strange woman like materializes out of the trees and he's like who is this and um he kind of like gets William in this hold and puts him in like kind of uses him as a human shield and he's like I wouldn't try that if I were you. You don't appear to be a very good shot. And she's like, oh shit, it talks. Um, and she, 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 she says, let him go. Please let him go. And he says, drop your weapons. And she says, how, how do I know that you won't kill both of us if I drop our weapons? And he says, how do I know that you won't shoot me as soon as I've let him go? And she, she's hesitating. And he says, you're thinking about it right now. You're thinking of doing exactly that. And she's like, no, I'm not. And he's like, don't lie to me. I'll always be able to tell if you're lying to me. And she asks, why is that? He says, because I'm better at it than you. <laughs> so they're having this like tense standoff. And she's hesitating and hesitating, doesn't know what to do. And he's watching her. And he says, OK, alternate proposal. Uh, 
drop your weapons right now or my wolves will tear you to pieces. And, and then she looks around and she realizes in the time that they've been talking, she's now surrounded by wolves. And these are, of course, Rowan's wolves, like the, his soldiers who had turned into wolves when the spell happened. And she's, she's caught. She recognizes that she has no choice, and she, so she drops her weapon. She surrenders. And he's like, better, now we can talk. Like, who are you? What are you doing? And he interrogates them. They're not supposed to be there in that forest, and they don't really want him to know who they are. But Rowan asks a number of pointed questions, and Maud's not a very good liar. So he pretty quickly deduces that they are the prince and princess of this neighboring kingdom. And he's like, that's very interesting. And he says, all right, like, let's all agree that I am entirely within my rights to imprison you or execute you, but this is what we're going to do instead. And he explains to them that his kingdom, his forest, has been having these issues with random hunters and people like wandering, like themselves, like wandering into his forest, which is a big problem because, of course, um, I mean, there are animals who are actually animals, who are always animals, but then there are, of course, a lot of animals who are actually cursed humans, and so hunters wandering into the forest are, is, a bad, is bad news. So he says, like, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go home, you're going to tell your dad, the king, to put an end to that. You're going to put like, security on your side of the border, you're going to institute harsh penalties for people encroaching, like trespassing on my land, and you're going to see to it we don't have this issue anymore. And William is like, yes, yes, thank you, whatever you say. And Rowan says, I wasn't talking to you, I was talking to her. You are coming back with me as my hostage. <laughs> and William's like, like, but why? And he says, because I don't trust you, obviously. And uh, so they, they start pulling them apart, like, you know, like William's being like, dragged back towards the castle and, and Maud's being dragged back to her kingdom. And then she cries out, she says, wait, take me instead. And like Roan was not expecting that. He's, so he's, okay, okay, sure, fine, whatever, like, and starts to exchange them. And then William freaks out. He's like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't listen to her. She's crazy. Like, you're going to take me, like, take me. And Rowan's like, oh my god, like, I, I don't care. <laughs> like, one of, one of you, like, work it out um, between yourselves. And so um, William and Maud have a huddle, and she, she says, okay, here's the thing. You've always been the good kid. Like, if you go back and you, you, you tell them to do this thing, they'll listen to you. I, I've always been the bad kid. It makes more sense for me to stay. And William hits back with what's essentially the chivalry argument of like, you know, you're my sister, I'm supposed to protect you, it's my fault you're in this situation, like, you know, I, like, I, like I, I should be the one to like risk my life. And um, Rowan's listening to them argue and he's like, yeah, I agree with her. <laughs> I, 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 I think her arguments are more persuasive, so we're, we're taking her. And so, <laughs> so, so now, you know, William is like dragged protesting away and he gets like, <laughs> He gets like ejected back into his lands. And meanwhile, Maud is traveling back to Rowan's castle with Rowan and his wolves and this wounded deer that she had shot. And she's being led deeper and deeper into this forest and the trees are getting bigger and bigger. And Maud, of course, is like really stressed and frightened, but at the same time, like, like these are the biggest trees she's ever seen, and she can't help but be like really intrigued by this forest around her. And she's being led deeper in, and, and then they round some sort of corner and some sort of cliff, and then there's a castle, which looks super out of place in this deep primeval forest. And so she's being led up to this castle, and then they, she's got like these wolf escorts on either side of her, and they, and as they cross over the threshold, the wolves turn into humans, of course. So and in my mind, it's this really visually satisfying transition because all these people, I mean, by the way, at this point in the story, Rowan's maybe 16 or 17, like several years have passed since the curse took hold. So these people are very used to this, these soldiers. And so like, you know, this like wolf paw will come down and turn into a hand and then the hand will push off and they like stand up as their human selves. and. Maud is watching this happen. She's like, oh my god, they're, 
They're, they're, they're people, they're shapeshifters, they're, they're, they're fairies. Oh my God, they're fairies. And um, like, the, the, like they were right, like the, the superstitious commoners, they were correct. And she's watching all these wolves coming into the castle, turning into humans. And then she sees this deer come in and this deer then turns into this wounded human and she feels, she feels like really guilty about that. And then finally bringing up the rear, there's the Rowan beast. And Rowan Beast like steps over the threshold and like you know turns back into his like fabulous human self, and she's like okay, uh, and, and and then she's like oh fuck it's the fairy king like uh, he's real like they they it, all of it's real all the stories are real, and oh geez how do I survive now she's trying to remember every fairy story she's ever heard and and like kind of like try to remember like the handbook for how do you survive fairy kidnappings. And so she gets, you know, escorted off into some sort of like holding cell. And Rowan, meanwhile, his attention has like completely moved on because, so to give you just, there's a lot of world building detail that I have to omit for this format, but like all the usual burdens of running a kingdom and then plus everyone has turned into animals, talking animals, but all the stuff still has to happen. Like, food and harvest still has to happen and taxes still have to happen and the military very much still has to happen because now they've got like poachers and they've got like wild animals that they're like vulnerable to and like like he's very busy and so he's going about his work and then these two soldiers come up to him and they're like, um, they're, they're kind of like really sheepish and they're like, not literally sheep, they're humans. Um, <laughs> they're, but, but they're like real sheepish and they're like, you know, you, you know that, that girl? He's like, what, what girl? And they're like, you know, like the, the, the princess that we captured by the, he's like, oh, oh right, okay, what, what about her? And they, they say like, she, she won't eat. And he's like, what do you mean she won't eat? Like to him, this is like, if you were to text your CEO that the toaster is broken. Like, like have you tried asking her more firmly? Like, uh, why is this escalating to me? And they're like, well, like, like and, 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 and they're like, well, we've tried like all kinds of stuff. We've tried giving her like different food, better food. Like she, she's very, very stubborn. And like short of holding her down and force feeding her, we don't know what else to try. And a big part of Rowan just really wants to say, okay, so do that. <laughs> like, like, like make the prisoner eat. This is like basic prison keeping. Like, uh, and he really, he's so hosed, he's so busy. He really, but something stops him. And it's like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to her or something. He, he's, he, he goes to talk to her and he like bursts into her, he like barges into her cell and he's irate. He's like, listen, princess like we made a deal in the forest like that you, I would get a hostage and you do not have my permission to starve yourself he, he basically assumes that she's acting in bad faith and doing some sort of hunger strike bullshit and um, this you know this demeanor does, is not effective like it doesn't really get him anywhere um, she's very stubborn in her own right so he has to like take a different tack and and and, and then He's talking with her and it comes out that the reason she won't eat the food is because she's convinced that he's a fairy and that they're all fairies and that if she eats the fairy food, she will be trapped forever in fairy world. That's what all the story said. And um, Rowan, this like s completely shocks him, like surprises him out of his funk and like, and he like laughs with surprise. He's like, that's adorable. Like Rowan in general is a person whose moods can change really quickly. So he, he's like, that's okay. Like, what makes you think that? And she's like, well, let's see. Like, you're, you're a shapeshifter. You live in a castle in an enchanted forest. You've got an army of talking wolves. You, it's like, okay, okay, I, I get it. But you, you've got this completely backwards. Like, I'm, I'm not a fairy. I'm a human who's been cursed by fairies. I'm on the same team as you. Like, and I'm, I'm glad we cleared this up. Like, you can eat the food. It's normal human food. It's safe to eat. And she's like, 
Or maybe you're trying to trick me into eating your fairy food. He's like, God damn it. She's like, you admitted to being a liar. He's like, I'm not lying about this. Well, and that's not persuasive. So um, he has to try yet another tack. So he's like, OK, fucking. All right, OK, you don't have to trust me, but you've come into the forest before. You've eaten the berries and the roots. And you've always been able to go home afterwards. So like, you're, even if you don't trust me, you're, you're just obviously incorrect. And um, she's like, well, maybe, or, but like, those were wild berries and stuff. Like, this is bread and soup. Like, for all I know, it's different. And he's like, <sighs> so, so then he, they, they, they kind of go back and forth. And then he comes up with like a proposal. Like, they, they figure out this deal where during the day, she can go outside the castle with an escort of wolves to make sure she doesn't run away and forage for herself, like just like fucking feed herself. And, um, and then as long as she comes back each evening, stays the night in the castle. And he asks like, would that be acceptable to, her, to you? And she says, I, I, I think so. And he's like, great, that's settled, goodbye. And he leaves. <laughs> and so anyway, now we enter this part of the story that's like Maud in this kingdom and, and this part of the story is, so this takes place over the course of an entire summer. And so there's a book I really liked as a kid called My Side of the Mountain. Yeah, where um, it's like about this like city kid who like runs away from New York City, decides to like live off the land and the Catskills. So it was like, it was like my jam when I was a kid. And this part of the story is basically that book, but with talking animals and magic and stuff. So she, um, She's like trying to teach herself how to properly live off the land and she's like not very good at it at first and she's like learning. And meanwhile, like she's having all these interactions with talking animals where all these people, all these animals, they, they really like talking to her because she's the only human. Outside of the war, she's the only one who's human. And so when they talk to her, they feel more like humans themselves. They can c connect with their human selves. And so she's like trying to do her stuff and all these animals want to talk to her. It's like very Disney princess again. And, um, Anyway, she, she all, and as time goes by, like she starts to learn a lot about these people and their culture and their history. And this, um, she, she increasingly, like, you know, she, she's hearing this version of the story th that is pretty consistent across tellings of what had happened there. And, and it starts to become more believable that Rowan was telling her the truth, that they were all humans and they were cursed by fairies. Uh, but she, she still doesn't quite trust them, but she, she kind of gradually s does start to like, kind of fall in love with this, these people and this place. And also, in particular, she develops these affectionate relationships with the wolves who are guarding her, especially like the wolves kind of enjoy her, like she's kind of fun to watch as she's like learning how to feed herself. And also, increasingly, as they start to trust her more, and it becomes apparent that she's not going to try to run away, and also, like, you know, this arrangement, it's working. Like, they're not, they don't get any more hunters, and it doesn't seem like they're going to need to kill her or anything. Um, it, it starts to become, like, a really easy and desirable gig to be on mod duty. And so they, they just, like, you know, she's not going to run away, and so they just get to, like, hang out and watch her, like, f forage. And it's, like, pretty fun and she's like pretty interesting so um, so meanwhile like her and Rowan still have this like really kind of brusque and like standoffish relationship because they both have this thing where they don't want to get close to the other person because Rowan like she is technically his hostage and the entire security of that border depends on her and the whole point of having a hostage is that there's a credible threat. You might kill them. So he, he doesn't want to get too close to her. Um, and then she, meanwhile, there's like all these fairy stories about like fairies being very dangerous and very deceptive and, like, and that they'll like seduce you. They'll like put spells on you and fuck with your mind. So she does not want to get close to him either. But they do start to learn a lot about each other by proxy, like via the wolves who are close with both of them. And she starts to get you know, a picture of him from their perspective, which, and she, which is very positive, like he's very well loved. And she starts, so there's this like gradual softening that happens throughout this summer. 
Um, meanwhile, Rowan, during this part of the story, he's like dealing with his own issues of like how to to break the spell. And the thing, the difficulty with him is that. So the fairy had said, like, come home and the spell will be lifted. And it, it was implied that that meant like surrender yourself to be taken into fairy world. Um, and even though Rowan doesn't know he's a fairy, he does have this like sort of latent fairy intuition when it comes to magic and spells. And words are very important, like, you know, like, like home, like that doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like fairy world would be home. And if it doesn't work, like he has this intuition that going to fairy world wouldn't actually break the spell. And if it doesn't work, he'll have no way of knowing. He'll have been kidnapped and disappeared. And then his people will be abandoned and they'll probably be slowly encroached upon by neighboring kingdoms and all the animals killed. And that would be really bad. So he, he's really torn where on the one hand, he really wants to surrender and go and find mom, find dad, find out what happened to them, maybe save them but he's got this like this, this duty that's holding him back. Um, so these are their kind of like parallel journeys throughout the summer. Um, meanwhile, so uh, as the summer progresses and they start getting close to autumn, everyone starts getting really hyped for this event that's coming up called Human Day. And Human Day is this thing that happens twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall, where it's a big party. It's this amazing party where the premise is you come to the castle and cram, everyone crams themselves in and they're all human for a, de for a night. And really great parties often have really great hooks. Like there's like some premise that gets you excited and gets you in the door. Then once you're in the door, you can layer all kinds of other experiences on top of it. And this party has the best premise, like it has the best hook. Because you come, you step over the threshold, you're a human again, you are already having the best night of your life. Like this, you're so glad to be here. This is a great party. And then on top of that, Rowan, Rowan like pulls out all these stops and he provides like, there's like music and dancing and theater and entertainment and the best food you've ever had. So it is a great fucking party. Um, it is also literally a great fucking party because if you are, for example, a fox and you've got a crush on someone who's a rabbit, like this, <laughs> this, this, this evening is kind of your one chance to maybe do something about that. So um, it is, you can get a sense of the, 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 the nature of this party. Um, so, so everyone is really, you know, and this isn't the first time that it's happened, so everyone knows what to look forward to and they are getting really excited and they are getting, now they're getting her excited about it. So they're like, oh my God, you're gonna be here for human day. Like, it's gonna be great. And, um, and, and they're excited for her to participate. So Maud, by the way, so Maud, throughout the summer, there's this like, there's this strange duality where on the one hand, you know, she is literally a prisoner. On the other hand, she, she's doing what she's always wanted to do. Like she's always wanted to like go and, be wild in the forest and like forage and like be this wild creature and she's finally like indulging her hobby in a way that she's never been able to and so in a strange way she's like happier than she's ever been but the main the main thing that's stopping her from being totally happy is she misses her family she especially misses William who like was her best friend and who like wanted to take her place and she doesn't know when she'll get to see them again and the wolves kind of take pity on her and they're like, okay, we, we don't know if we're supposed to tell you this, but, like, but it's, it's not forever. Like, what, what, will, what will probably happen is once the spell is lifted, you'll be able to go home. Because once the spell is lifted, like everything will be back to how it was and normal means of diplomacy can resume and you won't be needed anymore. So now she has a stake too in the spell being lifted. Um, so anyway, uh, so human day arrives and it's the sort of thing where the, during the day, all day, people are preparing for it and the parties in the evening and all day she's being like shunted excitedly from like staff to staff. Like they're like really excited to, to like get her dolled up and um, you know, she's kind of like helplessly being like made over <laughs> for this party and like feeding off of their excitement. And 
human, and then the, the evening arrives, and it is everything they said it would be and more. Like, she has never experienced anything like this before. And it's, and especially, like, on top of everything, like, the whole mood of the party, like, most, compared, especially compared to parties that usually take place in castles that are, like, very exclusive, well, this party is hyper-inclusive. Like, it's like, if there is a square foot of space that we can find for you to stand in and be human inside of, we will try and find that square foot for you. Like, the fire marshal hates this if they existed <laughs> in that time. And, and she's, you know, going through and moving through, like, all, this, all these different parts of the party, and everyone wants to talk to her, and everyone's, like, excited to, like, talk to her in their human forms. And, and, and it's this thing where she's never particularly enjoyed socializing before. Like, she's always been very weird, and she's still, like, this, like, weird kind of curiosity, but it's, like, a, in a positive way. Whereas before, it's this exasperated, like, why are you like this? But to them, I mean, this is an era where people don't travel very much, so most of them have never met anyone from her kingdom, and they just assume that she's weird because she's foreign. <laughs> like, like, you know, they're, they're very curious about her, like, fascinating culture. Um, so she is, like, having a really good time and, like, really enjoying socializing and enjoying these people in a way that she never has before. And throughout this party, there's this dynamic that keeps happening where, like, you know, they're, 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 Rowan and Maud are kind of, like, like, there'll be all these moments where she is watching him and he doesn't see her and vice versa. And they're seeing this, like, other side of each other where they've always been, like, really, like, brusque with each other, but, like, now seeing them, each other, like, interact with other people, like, this entire other sides of their personality come out. And it's really intriguing and, um, and she keeps watching him and, and you know, like all these, all these girls like come and dance with him and she, it's intimidating because they all seem like they're really good dancers and she doesn't feel like a very good dancer. She kind of chalks it up to their culture, it being a bigger thing in their culture. But the priority's progressing and the wolves, like the, the soldiers are getting like progressively drunker and louder. And, you know, and they're like both really chummy with them. And so finally they, they cross paths, like kind of in the wolf's corner. And like she kind of walks up to him and he like gives her a look. And he says like, oh no, she's loose. Like the prisoner's loose, which is a joke. She's had the free room of the castle for a while now. Um, but, um, you know, they're, they, they're, they're chatting and then like it's getting really hard to hear each other because these soldiers are very loud. And he looks at them and he's like, okay, all my wolves appear to be drunk, so I guess it's up to me to escort you. And so he takes her and leads her out to the dance floor. They have a dance. And it's, and she, it's this like beautiful thing. And she, in the course of this dance, she realizes it's not so much that everyone else was like a really good dancer, it's just that Rowan is a very good lead. And so they have this, beautiful dance together and it's romantic and flirty but it's also very much still within the realm of plausible deniability because they've both been dancing with lots of people it's what you do and it doesn't necessarily mean anything um, so then they you know they finish their dance they break apart they dance with other people uh, then at some point later they cross paths again and this time she's kind of like eyeing the buffet table because she hasn't eaten all day. Normally she feeds herself during the day, but she's spent all day being like shunted around by staff members. So she's really hungry and this food is really good. It looks amazing. And she's having this internal conflict where by now she's pretty sure that their story is true and that it really is just human food. And she's having this hesitation where like it's kind of a habit, but anyway, she, she's like, contemplating the food, and he comes up and he's like, I wish you would at least drink the wine, because very soon you and I will be the only sober people at this party. And she's like, what, you don't, you, you don't drink? And he's like, no, it dulls the senses. And she says, isn't that the point? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's like if, it's like if you said I don't eat because it makes me fool. And he says, why don't you eat? Like, are you still, worry that you'll fall under some kind of spell? Like, is that still a thing? She says, don't get offended. He says, I'm not offended. It's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of cool. It makes me sound really dangerous, but <laughs> like, um, 
and she's just you know not rising to the bait and then and then like kind of the the servers come out and they put more food out and they, they've got this big steaming tray of these little amazing vegetable pot pies all the food's vegetarian by the way and um, he, 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 he looks at them and he looks at her and he's like, okay, well, I'm having one. And he picks, he snags one off the platter and he's just like eating it messily out of his hands. And he's making a big show of how good it is. And she can't tell if he's fucking with her or if, or if that's just how he is with food. And he's eating and watching her and finally he's like, okay, you know what? Like, watching you starve is super boring. Um, I have an idea. Get a plate, load it up with anything that looks good, and come with me. And she's really suspicious. She's like, why? He says, you don't, just trust me. You don't have to eat it, but you know, you'll, you'll see what this is about soon. So she's like, OK. And she gets her plate, and, she, and it feels really dangerous because she's getting very tempted as she's choosing what to put on her plate. But she loads it up, and she brings it to him. And he, ta he takes it from her and offers her his arm and then leads her off through the castle. So they're, you know, kind of pushing their way through this crowded castle, like stepping around people as they're like fucking in the hallways, which is intriguing. Um, <laughs> and, and like, you know, they're, they're like making their way up and up and up and up to the highest point of the castle. And he brings her to his bedroom. And now she's really curious, like, what <laughs> is this about? And he, he continues through, opens the doors to his garden. And she did not know this was here. She did not know this was part of the castle. She's like, what is this? And she's this, cat, this huge birdcage garden. It's beautiful. And he leads her through to the edge where there's a, like a low circular garden wall, about like that high. And the bars of the wards are like spaced far enough apart that you can fit between them. And he helps her up. And beyond the, beyond the bars, there's like this wide ledge that you can sit on. He helps her out onto the ledge, and he puts the food on the wall. And then he like, gets like a handkerchief and like, covers it, covers the food with a handkerchief. And then he just slides it out to her. And as he slides it out to her, like, his hand, of course, is turning into a paw. And she's still not quite sure what this is about. But she's like, OK. Um, and she takes the handkerchief away. And beneath, now all the food has reverted into its wild equivalents. Like all the wheat has turned into grass seeds, and the fruits have converted into their wild equivalents. And so she, she lifts this handkerchief and sees this transformation. And Rowan's like, magic. It's like it's like playful thing. And she, she picks up a peach from the plate and it's a wild peach so it's not it's like a little lumpy and wormy and stuff and she's like this almost seems more dangerous than before and he says okay like fine you know at least I could say I tried you know suit yourself and he turns his back to her leans against the wall gives her some space and she's sitting there on the ledge contemplating this peach and the whole thing in the stories was that fairy food is supposed to be supernaturally beautiful and supernaturally delicious. And if you eat it, then forever after, human food will be like ash in your mouth, and you'll never be able to go home. But this just looks like a normal peach. Like It looks like the kind of food she's already been eating all the time. She's already crossed that bridge. Um, and she smells it, and it smells normal, and she finally takes a bite. And it tastes just like a normal peach. Normal, not that tasty, wild peach. And she's like, OK, I, I think this is OK. And she starts, to, she starts to eat. She starts to eat herself. And Rowan still has his back turned to her, but he can hear that she starts to eat. And she can't see him, but he gets this like, big smile. Because to him, it's like this, this gesture of trust, like this, like, this like, threshold that they've crossed, where she trusts him enough to do this, to eat off this plate. And they, you know, she's eating, and they're having a conversation. And she, she's like, this garden is amazing. And he says, yeah, my dad made it for me. And she says, do you, she, she'd heard, of course, about the king disappearing. And she's like, do, do you know what happened to him? He says, we think he was taken by fairies like that. They took my mother, it, it seems to make sense. but." I don't know, maybe he just decided he was tired of being king. I don't think he liked it very much. 
She says, what about you? He says, I'm not a king. Rowan is still holding out hope that dad will come back like he promised. And it's this kind of sad, vulnerable thing that he shared with her. And then she kind of, you know, like there's this noise coming up from the party, like there, this ledge overlooks, overlooks this courtyard. And she kind of scoots up to the edge of the ledge to like look down on the party and he kind of jumps up and joins her there. So he like turns back into his beast form as he's coming out past the bars and they're sitting together on this ledge and she compliments him on the quality of his party. And he says, well, it's been really hard for everyone and it's really important that a person has a place where they can be themselves. And she realizes that this thing that on the surface is really lighthearted and carefree and like debauched is like actually being done for really sober reasons. Like it's like solidarity, solidarity in a time of crisis. It's like public relations. It's all this stuff. And she starts like asking him these questions, kind of probing, pulling these things out of him. And what comes out is, so, so far he's always had this really kind of bossy, in control, like persona all the time. But as she's pulling stuff out of him, that, that facade kind of cracks and it comes out that he's really, he's really stressed and lonely and scared and he's like 17 or 18 at best at this point in the story and his mother disappeared and his father disappeared and he and everyone turned into animals and he's trying to, he, he's trying to do the best job he can but he doesn't know if he's good enough. And um, she, 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 tr she tries to say something encouraging, like, you know, everyone, everyone has a lot of faith in you that like, you're going to figure it out, that you'll, you'll break the spell. And of course she has the stake in the spell lifting. And he knows that and he, now he can't hold the truth back from her anymore, which is that he doesn't know how that's going to happen. He, he, he doesn't know how to break the spell. Like, you know, like home, what is home? Like the castle clearly doesn't count. Like he's left and come back so many times. It's never done anything. So what is, what is home? Like maybe he, maybe he doesn't have one to come home to. And sh she's taking that in. And then she says, well, it, it looks like I could be here for some time. And he says, do you hate me for that? She says, not anymore. And he gets this really sad look and he says, it's, it's not personal. And she says, I know. And he's like, okay, that's good. And she's, by now she's finished her meal and they've run out of plausible deniability and they're just on this ledge together and he's like, okay, I, you'll, you'll wanna get back to the party, I expect. And he like kind of like leaps out and lands as a human and offers her his paw and like helps her down and they start walking back the way they came. And as they approach these balcony doors leading back into the castle, he stops and he says, you'll, find your way from here? She says, aren't you coming? He says, no, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna stay up here and brood. And she's like, have fun. She's like, yeah, <laughs> I will. And, they, and, they, and she's hesitating and hesitating and they've, they've run out of plausible deniability and, and, and she starts to open the door to leave him and he interrupts her and he says, Maud? And she looks back and he says, it was never personal. And she's looking at him and looking at him and then she finally closes the door and comes back to him and, and takes his hand and they're, they've got this like intense like nonverbal moment together and then they kiss. And they're, they're making out <laughs> and uh, 
And, and then Rowan freaks out. He has like a freak out. He's like, oh shit, what am I doing? Ah, f we shouldn't, we need to talk about this. <laughs> and indeed, they need to talk about this. Like she's still his prisoner. Um, this is a, like not generally like a healthy like power dynamic to have <laughs> in a relationship. And um, so they talk about that. And then putting all of that aside, this whole situation and the curse and everything, even putting all that aside, they don't live in an era in which people like them can just, you know, date whomever. Like, the way it generally happens is like your parents arrange some sort of political alliance and then you get shipped off and you marry that person. Like, they're not, even in the best of scenarios, they're not supposed to be doing this. And so, you know, there's this point, they get to this point where Maud is essentially itemizing all the reasons they should proceed no further and forget this ever happened. And he's nodding along with her and and then she says I've, I've decided I don't care I want you do you want me and he looks at her and looks at her and finally he says you are so brave and they kiss again and this time they don't stop and things yeah th things <laughs> escalate from there <laughs> And that's the end of Act Three. <laughs> um, all right. All right, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going into Act Four, the, the, the longest and most. Okay, yeah. <laughs> act Four of Four. So, uh, so Act Four, so that scene happened at this like autumn human day and then act 4 extends you know continues on through this entire winter and into spring and and it it, it basically covers their relationship together they're like a couple i guess and it's really strange because setting aside the admittedly huge factor that she is still his hostage like they have they're otherwise having a very nice relationship. So they, they have all these things in common and they're, they've all, their entire lives, they've both been these strange, kooky, oddball, problem child weirdos. And they've been so lonely their whole lives. And, and then furthermore, like, so she might be his prisoner, but she's not his subject. Like she doesn't report to him. She's the only person that he ever gets to talk to who is not one of his subjects, not a citizen of this realm. And so they are able to like talk on the same level in a way that they don't have with anyone else. So they're having a pretty nice relationship, but there still are these a number of awkward boundaries that still exist in their relationship. So one of which is that she still does not eat the food. And at this point, it's, it's more a precaution or a habit than anything. Like she'll eat it in its wild form, but, and they just don't talk about it anymore. It's just like, oh, you know, eccentric mod with her dietary preferences. Like it, it, it's <laughs> just a thing, but it, it is this like slightly sad and awkward thing because it's kind of symbolic of the fact that she isn't 100% trusting him and trusting these people. And on his end, so they never actually have intercourse like they do other activities, but they, so he, he does not want to get her pregnant, which is understandable because again, this credible threat goes completely out the window if she is pregnant with his child. Like they're already playing a very dangerous game with their, this like illicit relationship that they're having. So that's another sort of awkward boundary that they've got. Um, and, and then Maud gets this idea that takes hold and just won't go away, which is that <clears throat> maybe things don't have to be this way. Like this whole hostage situation, may, maybe it doesn't, maybe it's not necessary. Like maybe they could do this whole thing above board. Like, like what if she, what if she went back and she talked to them, to her family? Like she explained to them the truth about this kingdom and that it used to be a kingdom. And, and she doesn't think, like, you know, the, the border has been quiet this entire time. They don't have any particular incentive 
to come invade the forest. So like maybe she could go back and they would, everything would still be okay. And, and maybe if she told them all the stuff that she's learned, it would break the illusion. Like, like she's learned so much about them and maybe it would actually break that, that illusion and then they could, normal diplomacy could resume, etc. And it's worth pointing out that if it weren't for this curse and this illusion, like she and Rowan would be considered a pretty reasonable match for each other. Um, Rowan is pretty skeptical. Um, because, so there's this ongoing tension throughout the story with Rowan, which is essentially does he do things the human way or the fairy way? Um, and he, the human way is all about logic and rationality and utilitarianism. And the fairy way is all about instinct and feelings and doing what seems right. And so far, Rowan has tried really hard to do what dad would do, to, to do things, to listen to his human side. Um, and again, he doesn't know that he's a fairy, but the, like, he's got, he still has this dual nature within himself. Like, all this stuff that he's done with Maude is like the major exception to that, this like imprudent thing that he's doing. And meanwhile, his instincts are screaming at him that he needs to let her go and that they won't, and he, he's in love and he knows that they won't ever really be a proper couple until he's like set her free. And so, and, and she's working on him and working on, on him all through winter and finally, finally he gives in to that fairy instinct and he agrees, he agrees to let her go. And it's this really fraught decision for him. And as soon as she, they, they say their goodbyes at, at the gate and then she goes off. And as soon as she leaves, he's like, I, I hope I did the right thing. He doesn't know if he did. So she rocks up to her kingdom after being missing. By this point, she's been missing for like a year. And she shows up and she's like, hi. And they're like, oh, oh my God, you're back. Like, how did you, how, how did you escape? Like, and she's like, I didn't escape, they let me go. And they're like, the, that monster let you go? And, and she's like, he's, he's not a monster, he's, he's a human. They're, in fact, they're all humans. Like, all these animals, they were cursed. And the, there were this kingdom and we used, to, we used to know them, we used to trade with them and they have like, you know, and she's just like reciting all of her kingdom facts at them. And, and they look at her and they're like, you poor child, you've, you've been through such an ordeal. Please come home, it's, it's all over now. It, it, everything's gonna be okay, you're safe now. She's like, but the, the, the thing? And, and, and they're like, you're, don't worry, this is very normal. You're, you're in shock, like, come on, like, just come home, rest, we've got you now. So, you know, basically it didn't work. They, and she now, in the harsh light of day, in her old bedroom, in her old castle, surrounded by like normal, non-talking animals and all this, like no hint of magic, she starts to doubt her own experience. Like she, she, and she's being gaslit to hell about all her memories. She's being made to feel crazy and she honestly is not sure anymore. Like maybe, maybe she is under some sort of illusion. Like she, she, she thinks she loves him, but like she kind of ate his food, like all that stuff happened after she ate his food and she doesn't know. And like there's, there's this thing where there, there are these like two parallel narratives for the same events and she doesn't know which one to subscribe to and she's super torn. And in the end, there's no tiebreaker. She just has to choose. She just has to choose which truth to believe in. And it takes a while, but finally she chooses to, she says, you know, you know what, I, I choose to believe myself. I choose to believe my own memories and that all of this was real. And I, I gotta go back. I, I, I can't do this. I, I gotta go back. And she tries to go back. Unfortunately, there is an entire <coughs> like border patrol now that exists for the express purpose of preventing that from happening. And she gets caught 
And now it's a crisis because it's like, holy shit, our daughter tried to run away. This is a big deal. It's, and it's like a political issue too because like it's, it's, she was supposed to secure this like other allegiance and now it's like a very offensive to them that she tried to run and they're like, oh, oh what, what's wrong with her? And they've, they've got their own kooky fairyologist consultant and th this, this fairyologist is like, I, I'm pretty sure your daughter is under a spell of some sort. She, she's under the thrall of the fairy king. And so they're like, oh, we gotta cure her. And they, they're trying all of these folk remedies to cure her of her affliction. It's terrible for her. A lot of these things are very uncomfortable. And, and it doesn't work. And, and finally, they reach this conclusion, which they don't arrive at lightly, because it's very, it's very, has very major implications, but they, they conclude that the only way to free her and like restore this thing is to kill the fairy who put the spell on her. Th that, that, would f that would free her. And so they, they conclude that essentially they have to go and they have to go like murder Rowan. And this is, this, this is for her like, this is exactly what she, 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 she she's in this nightmare where she, can't stop this from happening. Like she's like a prisoner in her own castle and they're now like preparing this expedition. Uh, we're gonna leave them alone for a bit, leave them aside and let's go back and see what's going on with Rowan. So what's going on with Rowan is Rowan is depressed. So Rowan in general is a person who suffers from abandonment issues. Like his mother left under mysterious circumstances. His father left. Now Maud has left and she is She's been gone for a while. It's, he's, he's like a big ball of anxiety. And like it, it, things seem to be okay. Like the, the border is quiet. He keeps like anxiously sending more and more wolves to that border. And the quiet is like unnerving. It's like freaking him out. And um, he, 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 he's just like waiting and waiting and fretting and fretting. And he, one night, you know, he's asleep in his garden. So one of his eccentricities is he generally sleeps outside in his garden and he's like fitfully sleeping. And then he wakes up to the sound of wolves howling. And he's like, oh, oh shit, what's that? And they have, of course, a whole signaling system with the wolves and they're howling. So he gets up and he, he turns in the direction of the, of the sound and if this, were, if this were a movie or a TV, like you wouldn't see what he's seeing at first, you would see his reaction to it. And he walks up to the edge of the garden and he's looking out in the direction of the howling. And he stops at the edge of his garden. And then you see what he sees, which is that his forest is burning. And he's standing there watching his kingdom burn and in his mind he's thinking I fucked up I fucked up like, like, d damn it like, I, I knew I knew it was wrong I, 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 it's not what dad would have done and I was, I was stupid and selfish and in love and I let her talk me into it and I, I, I knew I shouldn't have and god damn it like and he, he, he wraps a fist around one of the bars of the birdcage and he takes just like 10 to 30 seconds and like leans into the pain and just like grieves for the fact that this is happening, for the fact that like Maud has betrayed him as far as he can tell. And then he snaps out of it and he snaps into ice cold like warrior prince mode and he got shit to do. So he goes and he rounds up his soldiers, rounds up his wolves, he, he's massing them inside his castle and this whole sequence is like really intense and nonverbal and in my, in my mind but it's got this character of like, gentlemen we're going to war, follow me, this is happening. And he, he's looking out over these ranks of soldiers and they're looking back at him with these like really serious expressions and then he turns and he runs out, he takes like a running leap, transforms midair, lands 
as a Rowan beast on the other side and, and runs off and then behind him like the, these ranks of soldiers are coming following him and they fan out into the forest like these this loosely organized wolf pack so Rowan's on Rowan's on the move he's off to go like fuck him up and meanwhile with William so Will, William's kind of leading this expedition he's got these his own soldiers and they had they had set this fire because so their objective in coming here is explicitly to assassinate him and it's much easier to do that if he's outside his castle so they set this big like fuck you fire to like draw him out and it works you know he they're like come at me bro and he's he's coming at them <laughs> and um and I want to give you a sense of this battle, this war that's taking place from the perspective of like a poor random schmuck in William's army. So think about what you're up against. So you've got this army of wolves. They're as intelligent as humans, and there's a lot of them. They are well-led, well-organized, mission-driven on their home turf. Furthermore, they don't so, it's not so much that they want you to die. They want you to run. They want you to desert your army and your commanders, run in terror back to your own land, and ideally tell everyone you encounter what a bad time you had in that forest. <laughs> Never go there. Rowan wants to maximize desertions with like minimum casualties, so he's like up for both sides, and he is, they're out there committing like psychological warfare, <laughs> like, like guerrilla attacks. It's, it's full on horror movie, bad times for these people. So this war is waging. Meanwhile, Maud has managed to escape, like in, because uh, she's a badass, and she is <laughs> riding desperately through the forest, breakneck speed. And and Maud, like this, th th this th th this this war, like she doesn't want either. She doesn't want anyone involved in this conflict to be hurt, and she's so afraid for all of them, and she's so ashamed of her her role her like accidental role in this happening and like this 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 thing she she promised that it would be okay she he didn't want to do it and she persuaded him and this thing is so important to him and it's important to her too like she's fallen in love with this land and 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 she is just like desperate and and she she she, she rides up she, she she she's like her horse is all lathered she she rides up to this castle and and there's like this small force of people who are, have remained behind in the castle to defend it. And, and, and she charges up and, 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 and they're like, oh, oh, you're back. Like, what? Do you know what's going on? Why are you attacking us? And she's like, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I never meant for this to happen. I just, like, they, they wouldn't listen. And take me hostage again. Like, like, please just take me hostage again. And they're like, okay. And they, they take her <laughs> hostage. And they then they send this um, they, they send messengers out to the battle, and they, they send messengers to like both sides, and they and they they manage to, to get through, and they and the message is essentially like everyone stop, we've got Maud, Maud is in the castle. This is like a this like really unexpected blow to William. He's like what how, and Rowan's like what how like like, like <laughs> and and Rowan Rowan's. Rowan's knee-jerk reaction is he, he really, he's like, oh, she's back, but like, he wants to believe that she, that she didn't betray him and that she, she was telling the truth, and, but he doesn't know, like, is it a trick? Is, maybe it's to get their side to stop fighting, but in any case, for both sides, step one is go and personally verify the information, like, go see for your, with your own eyes if this is true. So there's, like, a ceasefire, and they make their way back to the castle and the drawbridge comes down and the gates open and there's Maud just like they said and for the for the human army for Maud's family this is like a massive like slap in the face it's it's a it's a huge blow because they they've taken on this enormous risk they they've lost people in the fighting they they mounted this big expedition just to save her and now 
it's all for nothing. Now she's given herself up and she's betrayed them and, and there's nothing they can do about it. So they're like, I, I guess we've lost. And William's like, no, we, we, can't, we can't abandon her. They're like, we, we've lost. Like, face it, like she, 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 they have her. We're going home. So they go home. But William is not prepared to give up on his sister. And so while everyone else is going home, he manages to hide himself, conceal himself with his like woodscraft. And he, he, doesn't, he doesn't know what he's going to do, but he, he's not ready to give up. And he, he's hiding, trying to come up with some sort of plan. Meanwhile, Rowan's army goes up and she's standing there in the doorway and, she, and there's all these wolves, this big pack of wolves and they're that, many of which are her friends and they're looking at her with these really serious eyes. And I want to take a moment, highlight, you know, emphasize how brave Maud is being and coming here. Like her kingdom has committed an act of war against this one. And if they don't believe her about her role in that, then they might kill her. They might still kill her, even if they do believe her. It's, she, she is putting her life on the line to save these people that she loves. So it's, she's being super brave. So, but anyway, she, she's standing there, and then the, the pack, the ranks part, and Rowan steps through in his beast form, and he, he walks up, and they're, they're looking at each other from across this drawbridge for like the first time in, in weeks or months. And she sees him and she, she kind of, she steps over the threshold outside the war. She, she, she reaches out to him and she's like, hey. And his, his ears go back and he's, he's like this wary, untamed, skittish animal right now, like sits back on his haunches and is just watching her. And so I, I'm sorry, I, n I never meant for it to happen, but I, I, I couldn't stay away. I, I, I had to, th they wouldn't listen to me and, and she can't tell if she's getting through to him. She can't tell if he believes her and she's so ashamed. She's, she, she's, she just wants to disappear into like a tiny ball and all these people, all these, all these wolves, are, they're just watching her and she can't get away from their gaze and she doesn't know what to do. She has no choice, but to, she, she pours her whole heart out to him. And she says, I, I'm, pl please believe me, I'm sorry. I, I love you. I don't ever want to be apart from you again. Like, just please believe me, please, please come home. Please come back to me. And Rowan, Rowan doesn't know what to believe. He, he's experiencing this internal struggle that's very similar to the struggle that she was experiencing earlier where there's these, these two narratives, either of which could be true, and he doesn't know what to believe. He doesn't know if it's safe to trust her. And just like with her, in the end, there's no tiebreaker. He just has to choose. It's just as we all have to choose. There's this leap that you take in love. And he starts walking towards her. And as he's walking towards her, he starts turning back into a human. His, his fur retracts back into his body, and his like paw comes down, and turns into a hand and pushes off the ground and his, his, his antlers like drop to the ground and land behind him and he's, he's turning back into a human and he reaches her and goes to her and she puts his arms around him and squeezes and from that moment, from that squeeze, this shock wave emanates out. And as it emanates out, the forest is turning back into farms and towns, and the wolves turn back into people. And the spell is lifted. The spell is lifted because Rowan, the prince, has come home to Maud. He's come home to her, like his home was, was her all along. 
So anyway, the spell is lifted. Yay. <laughs> like, wow. Oh, geez. Um, so people, people are out of their minds with joy at this development. So like, you know, human day, that party, this is basically human day, but like turned up to 13 and, and, uh, and not just inside the castle, it's everywhere now because they're everywhere has been restored. Everyone is like just blowing <laughs> up <laughs> the kingdom with celebration. And, um, and the, but the story isn't over because like M William is still lurking somewhere and mom, this is a setback for mom because um, this, is, this is not how she imagined the spell breaking. And to her, it's as though she's watching him relive her own mistakes, you know, where she dated this human and it ended badly. And she, and to her, like, she's now, that Maude is now keeping him away from his real home, which is fairy world, and she, she starts cooking up some sort of scheme to try to break him apart. But anyway, meanwhile, like, this, like, human day festivities are happening, and they, uh, Ronan Maud, kind of steal away into his garden, and he's got like a plate of food, as he does. And instead of going out to the ledge this time, they sit down together in the middle of the garden, and he's got this fork full of food. And and he's looking at her, and there's this like this nonverbal question, like, is this is this okay now? And she meets his gaze, and she eats his food. And he, they cross that boundary together, and he, he gets this huge, huge smile. He, and she, she's, she, she's trusting him. She's choosing to trust him, and they're having this, like, this, this meal, and he's just like, kind of like, <laughs> like spoon-feeding her, and she's humoring him, even though it's a little embarrassing. And it's, they're, having, they're having this like, beautiful trust dinner, this beautiful trust meal, which transitions into beautiful trust sex. <laughs> um, and they, 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 they finally do it. Um, and it's, it's glorious. Anyway, so, and then afterwards, he, um, afterwards he, he's looking out over the courtyard, looking out over the kingdom at the edge of the garden, and she comes up beside him. And she says, you're allowed to admit it, you know. And he says, admit what? She says, I liked it better as a forest, too. <laughs> he laughs, he's like, yeah. And it's, it's not up to us, though, is it? She says, nope. And they have a moment together. And then she says, I'm, I'm going to go rejoin the party. Do you want to come? He says, no. no. Well, he says, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe in a bit. And she leaves and she goes back to like the bedroom portion and she's you know, getting ready to go back to the party. And he has, he's alone now at the edge of his garden. And he, he's looking out over these celebrations and then he, he takes his hand and he extends it out past the wards. And whereas before it would have turned into a paw, now it's just a hand. He's, he's lost part of himself. Uh, he, he really liked being a beast. And he's lost it, and it's really sad. And he, he's just having a mo private moment to himself to, to like mourn for that. And then, the, you know, this like, these like raucous sounds are coming up from throughout the kingdom, and he, it's this really bittersweet thing where he's lost this thing, lost this part of himself, but, he, what, but he's bought this happiness for these other people. Like that, this is, this joy that is before him, this is what he's bought with his sacrifice. And he makes his peace with it. He lets it go. He says, this is, this is worth it. I'm glad this happened. Like, this is what he's always been taught his whole life. And so he, he kind of smiles to himself. And then he starts to go back through his garden to go like rejoin the party, rejoin Maud. 
And as he's walking through his garden, he hears, he hears like a strange sound. He hears like a thrum sound. And he, he's got these, he, he, bef before he even registers that he's heard something, he, he like jumps. He's got these like instincts. He jumps and he gets shot in the leg by an arrow. So he, he gets shot and he, he screams and Maud rushes out. She's like, what, what happened? And she sees, that he, she, she sees that he's been shot. She's like, oh, that, that looks bad. Okay, like, you'll, lie down, lie down. You'll, you'll, you'll be all right. I'll, 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 I've got you. And Rowan's wounded and, and he starts screaming. He starts screaming in this incoherent animal agony, this like wordless pain. And he, he manages to get out the word, pull it out. And she says, no, 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 you don't, you don't want to do that. He says, pull it out. And he, he, he grabs the arrow and pulls it out. And now he's bleeding a lot. And she's like, now you've done, uh, uh, calm, calm down, calm down. Just shh, like, lie down. I, and she starts you know, tearing strips of cloth off of her, her dress and bandaging the wound, trying to stop the bleeding. And she's, she's calling for help. It's really hard to be heard over the music. And Rowan is like, Rowan is like lying on his side with his arrow and his fist. And the arrow is covered in his own blood. And then the tip of the arrow, his blood is boiling. This iron broadhead, it's, it's, it's smoking and steaming and, and sputtering with this his, his, his fairy blood is like, is like boiling upon this arrow. And, 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 he, and he's staring at it and it, and, and it doesn't, doesn't make sense to him. And then meanwhile, like, so a lot of stuff is happening in parallel while this is happening. So the moment he gets shot, and of course he got shot because William had managed to infiltrate and find a position on the roof and waited for his moment when Maud was not in, in the garden anymore. And the moment he gets shot, these roses start growing out of the grounds around the castle. They start like, like really dramatically climbing the walls of the castle. And meanwhile, all these people who are celebrating their, their return to humanity, they, they see this happening and they're like, oh my god, it's the fairies again. Oh, oh no, we, we thought we were out of the woods. Ah. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and like the, 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 these roses are growing and growing and um, they, they climb up to the top of the castle, to this birdcage, and they're, they're trying to grow into the castle. Like the, these roses are his, his mother's magic, her, her, his mother's influence. And she's, she, 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 she's desperate to reach him. Like she, he's hurt and the, the wards are keeping her out. So she, she, she's trying to penetrate this space. And as the roses grow into the birdcage, they catch on fire. So now there's these burning roses all throughout this, the, this bird cage. And she's trying desperately to reach him. She's trying to grow faster than she can burn. And she's making some headway, but not a lot. And, and meanwhile, so Rowan is like watching his blood boil. And he, and then he sees these roses burning, this like dome of roses burning and he like puts two and two together and he, and he realized he has this enormous epiphany he realizes oh my god Ma mom wasn't taken by fairies mom is a fairy and I'm half fairy and it explains so much it explains so much and this weird outsidery feeling he's had his entire life makes sense for the first time and he knows for the first time who he is. He's aware of both sides of himself. And it's, it's huge that he know this, the truth, it's huge, it's validating, it's earth shaking. And he, he lets the arrow drop from his hand and he, re he recognizes finally that these roses that they represent his mother, he recognizes her and he reaches out and as he does that gesture, the, this anti-magic field, this force field, the, the wards that are keeping her out, they shatter because he's inviting her in. 
He's letting her in. And the roses come exploding into the garden, and they're reaching out to him, and they, you know, he's holding his hand out to her, and they start growing all down his fingers and his arms, like wrapping him, holding him. And previously in the story, they, they've been like this like sinister, brambly thing, but in this moment, they're like tender and green, and now his body is like covered in flowers. And there's this one rose that's in the palm of his hand, and he's and this, this one rose that's blooming, supernaturally beautiful rose that's blooming for him. And he's in too much pain to speak, but what's going on inside his mind is like, hey mom, I've, I've missed you, I've missed you so much. It's, it's so good to see you again. And, and her, in her side of it, she's freaking out because her, her child's been shot with iron, which for a fairy is real bad news. But she's hanging on desperately. She, she's like, it, it's, he'll, he, he'll be fine, he, he'll be okay. He's human. He's human, he's just like his father. He's, He's going to rule this kingdom. He's going to marry this girl. He's he's gonna it's it's gonna be he, he'll he'll survive this. He's human. He's human. He's human. He'll he'll be all right. And meanwhile, Maud, while this is happening, she like she she she, she feels like those words shatter. She sees like these roses coming in, and it's like this unexplainable magical thing. But she's like, oh, deal with that later. Like she 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 <laughs> um, right 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 now she she she's got to like you know. She bind up his wound. She, she's, she needs to stop the bleeding. So she, she's hyper, hyper focused on bandaging him, on, on, on saving him. And, and meanwhile, Rowan is having this moment with his rose. And everything, everything about this moment, like the music, the, 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 the everything is, is, is telling you that this is a profoundly happy moment for him. Uh, he is finally at peace with himself. He's finally at peace with both parts of himself. He's finally reunited with his mother, whom he hasn't seen since he was three, and that he's missed so much. And this is an amazing, happy moment for him. And then, as he's having this moment, his hand relaxes and goes limp on the ground and the tension leaves his body and the light leaves his eyes and Rowan dies. The moment that happens, all motion ceases. So up until now, like the, there's all this motion, where all the roses are like growing so 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 desperately and and so vigorously, and then all of a sudden they they stop, and everything is still and everything is silent, and then this rose that is in his hand, it shrivels up and wilts and drops its petals, and now all over his body these roses are wilting, and all over the birdcage, there's this soft, weeping rainfall of rose petals coming down over this space. And Maud, Maud is still working on his leg. She's still, she's still bandaging him, and she hasn't realized, it's not until, like, you know, the, the roses start falling down and start, like, covering the ground that she realizes that something has changed. And she looks at him and, and she sees it but doesn't see it at the same time. Like it it, it, it makes no sense. Like he, he he should be fine. Like she'd stop the bleeding. Like he, he and she's looking at him, she goes, hey, 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 look at me. Look at me. And 
and, and, and now, now, now she's got this rising panic. It doesn't make sense. Like, was he, was he hurt somewhere else? Did she, did she miss some, something? Did she, and she, she starts frantically searching his body, trying to find where else was he hurt. And then, and, and then as she's searching, then she sees this arrow, and it's still smoking. And she picks it up, and she's trying to understand what it means. And then meanwhile, William has managed to like fight his way through the roses, managed to like climb to the garden and like push his way through. And, and he's coming up to her and he's like, hey, hey, Maud, are you all right? And, and she's holding this arrow and she looks at him and she's like, what, what did you do? He, he says, it's, it's all over now, it's okay, you're, you're free, you're, you're, you're safe now, it's, it, like, come with me. And, and she, she's staring at him, she, she's confused, she doesn't understand what's happened, and, he's, and he says, Maud, it's, he's dead, he can't hurt you anymore, all right? He, like, it's, come home, it's, t it's time to go home. And she's staring at him, and she goes, what did you do? She throws it at him, and now she turns back to Roan, and she, she, now it's finally landing for her that Roan is gone. And she starts crying and freaking out and grieving in earnest. And, and, and William's watching her, and he doesn't understand. He does, like, she should be free now. That's what the, that's what all the, stories said like the spell should have been broken like is and he, he comes up and and like he, he's trying to figure out like is is it a trick like is like what, what's what's wrong and he comes up and he like reaches down to see to see if Rowan's actually dead or if this is some other magic and as he does that Maud, Maud says go away Go, go away, don't touch him! And she, she shoves him away. She's got this terrible, terrible fury in her eyes. And he's looking at her, his sister, whom he loves so much. And she, she's got this terrible fury. And then she crumples and she lies down next to Rowan. She pulls him into her arms. And as she's, as she's mourning, William is watching her and he he realizes slowly that this was real and and she wasn't under a spell and that these were two people who were genuinely in love with each other and he realizes what he's done and he tries to tell her that he's sorry but it's too late. Meanwhile, with, so mom and dad are in fairy world, and mom, so losing a child is supposed to be the worst emotional pain that you can have. And her, her grief, her enormous grief, breaks the spell that dad's been living under because it makes no sense in the context of this illusion, it makes no sense, this, this enormous, overwhelming grief. And, I mean, like, poor dad, like, this incredibly harsh awakening that he has, like, he, he'd he been living this, this, like, false paradise, and now he remembers, now the illusion lifts, and he remembers that his whole parents, his whole family, his parents, his siblings, they all died, and this, he remembers this falling out that he had with his wife, and and he remembers, oh my God, Rowan, like he, how long has it been? He's, all, he's been all alone. And mom has no choice but to admit to him what's happened. And they've got this, they've got this enormous shared grief together. And you might expect that it would, that this would drive them apart, but in this paradoxical way, so each of them, their conflict, this conflict they had with each other, they, each of them had had this, had been so 
attached to like a particular life, a particular outcome. Like, it was so important to them that they, that Rowan live a certain way and that they not lose him to the other parent. And now in, the, in light of what's happened, all those things seem so small and so unimportant. Like I, I've realized I don't care. Like I, even if I never saw him again, I, that it would, it would be, it'd be okay. I just, I just want him to be alive again somewhere. And, and so in that letting go, they're able to understand each other. They're able to s fully integrate like both of their worldviews and, and talk and reconcile in a way that they've never been able to before. And, and it's not like a, like, a, like a fake, like this false reconciliation they had before. It's, it's, it's like true and deep. And they, and despite everything, despite everything that's happened, like at this, le at, the, at one level, they still love each other, but they, they can't be together because dad has to go home. My dad has to go home to his kingdom. And in this, in this moment, they let go of each other. They let go of this possessive energy that they've had towards each other their entire relationship. And they say goodbye. They know they, they love each other, but they can't be together. He has to go home. So dad, dad rocks up. He's, he's been missing now for years. And everyone, everyone had given up on him. Everyone thought he was gone forever except Rowan. And so everyone is like really stunned to see him. They all, they all react like, like he's a ghost. And um, he finds Maud. He, he kind of heard this parts of the story from, from, from mom because she, she'd seen it and he knows who Maud is. He finds her. And when Maud sees him, like her, she's never met him before, obviously, so when she first sees him, he and Rowan very strongly resemble each other. So when she first sees him, it's like seeing Rowan is back from the dead. Um, and then she, she, she realizes that it's, it's not him and it's, it's someone new. And, um, and he's, he, he introduces himself. He's like, I, they, they tell me that you buried my son and they have a conversation and they catch each other up on essentially everything we know, all these parts of the story, they, they share that with each other and um, and, 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 and in, this, in, this, in this winding down, we, um, there, there's, this, there's this letting go that happens. So mom and dad, they let each other go. And then William, Will, William was expecting to be like put to death because of what he did, but they, what they do instead is they say, you're gonna go back, you're going to explain the truth, and they're gonna listen to you, and you're gonna see to it that there's, that there's peace between the kingdoms. And the price is, you also have to explain that Maud is not coming home again. She's never coming home. And so there's this, this letting go. And for him, it's like death would have been better. Like he'd, he'd, there's like a heroism to that. He kind of accepted it. And instead it's like this, his sister whom he loves so much and whom he's hurt so terribly and there's nothing he can do to m make it right. And so he, he has to let her go. And, um, but then the, the, sort of, the sort of happier side of all of this is there's peace now. There's, there's peace between William's kingdom and their kingdom and this fairy realm and this human realm which have been at war with each other for, for years. They, they arrive at like a true peace with each other. And 
the kingdom starts experiencing lots of random good luck and prosperity. And so far in this story, the, the, sto the fairy stories that have been alive in this world have been like the fairy stories about like sinister, dangerous fairies. And, but there's also all these classic folklore tales about helpful, benevolent fairies and positive magic. And those stories start to come alive now in this kingdom. And this, this kingdom is now forever touched, forever tinged with magic. And that's Rowan's legacy to his kingdom. That's what was bought with his sacrifice. And then finally, at the very, at the very end, there's this, this moment where dad is, he's going out onto the grounds to visit his family graveyard and the groundskeeper apologizes. He's like, I, this all happened so recently, we haven't had time yet to make, to carve proper like, grave markings for him. And he says, like, don't worry about that, I'll, I'll find him. And he's walking through this graveyard and he's one by one, he's passing the graves of every person who died to make him king, his parents and his brothers and his sisters and then finally, at the very end of the row, there's a fresh, freshly dug grave, unmarked, but just completely overgrown with wild roses. And as he approaches the, the roses, they kind of retreat a bit. They retract and they make a space for him. They allow a space for him. And he sits down. And he sinks his fingers into the freshly dug soil. And, and he, he says, like, hey, kid. Hey, buddy. It's dad. I have come home. He's having his moment of grief there. And, and then meanwhile, his his wife is there in the roses, and his son is there in the earth. And this entire story, these three characters, in their own way, they've been on this mission to try to reunite with each other, to try to find each other again, and try to be a family together again. And now they're separated across this, these uncrossable chasms between worlds. They can never be together again. But then in another sense, in this moment, this visual moment with this king and these roses and the earth, like they, they are together. And meanwhile, meanwhile, like the, the kingdom's at peace, the, the, the sun is shining, the birds are singing. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. That's the end of the story.